Hello and welcome to livealittlehigher.com. This week we read Parasha Miketz and um, we're almost finishing up Hanukkah. We have the tonight and tomorrow night. And all these parashas of, of Yosef going down to Egypt and paving the way for the Jewish people to come into Egypt and descend and uh, actually is the story of the Jewish history it contained in Joseph's history is our history contained and the evolution of the Jewish people through the ages but really it's these stories of, of Jacob and his 12 sons and Yosef being taken down to Egypt it's a type of an exile, it's the beginning of the exile of the Jewish people and a lot of the secrets of exile are contained in these parashas. So this uh, parasha Miketz is the 10th section, it's in the 10th section of the book of Bereshit and it's a chronicle of Joseph, it begins, <clears throat> it begins after he is taken out of, uh, of, of prison uh, Miketz in its own word means at the end, at the end in Hebrew this is what it means and it's really alluding to Messiah and the redemption and what we're all yearning for. I was talking with a friend these days and she says we need, we, we, we want Messiah now. Everybody says we want Messiah now. I said we don't want Messiah now, we need Messiah now. He became a necessity now because the world is so upside down and thank God we are able to see how upside down it is that we come to realize that there's something very wrong. So Joseph, Joseph, if we remember last week in, the, in, in, in last parasha, parasha Vayeshev, we saw Joseph begin his odyssey going down to Egypt. He was sold by his brothers to, to an Ishmaelite caravan. He came down to Egypt. He ended up becoming a slave in the house of Potiphar, who was actually like the vice president of the nation. And, um, and he ended up uh, trying to be seduced by Potiphar's wife, which he ran away from. And the wife then started saying Lashonara about him, saying that he had tried to rape her. He ended up in jail. And after the first year, in when he came into the jail, uh, the, the guard of the jail started to see him with good eyes. He, Joseph was charming. He was a person that had hain, that had grace, that everybody that met him liked him except his brothers. But otherwise he was a person with hain, with charm, with, with, uh, with uh, grace. And the administra administrator of the, of, the, of the prison had a liking into him. And this is how he met because he gave him the key of all the prisoners in the in the ward because he saw how Joseph had this way with people when they saw him when he saw people that looked down he would go to them and try to bring them up so he gave them the 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 the, the, the key to go into every prison and bring up the spirits of the of the people that were in jail. And so we see that there he meets the the wine bearer and the and the bread maker of, of, of Pharaoh and they come with two dreams, each one has a dream, and he interprets their dreams, and they come to become true. The, 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 the baker is hanged, and the wine bearer is restored to his uh, position, and he tells him, at the end of last parasha, parasha Vayeshev, he tells him to not forget him, to please tell Pharaoh about his qualities of uh, interpreting dreams, and that he should remember him so he can come out of jail. And what happens there? The wine bearer forgets and he's stuck in jail for two more years. So we see that there's a pattern of events uh, in Joseph's life, in one where he's up here, then he goes down here, then he again goes up here, then he again descends and goes down. And he's up and down, up and down until he becomes the viceroy of Egypt. Two years later, he's remembered. Um, the the wine bearer remembers him, and he um, and he he tells Pharaoh that there's this Jewish boy, this, there's this Ivrit 
in, in the prison that knows how to interpret dreams. Pharaoh has these two famous dreams, which actually are only one dream. It's the same dream in which he dreams with seven fat cows and seven skinny cows. And he dreams that the skinny cows eat the seven fat cows. And then he dreams a second dream, which he dreams of seven fat uh, corn kernels and seven skinny corn kernels and the fat kernels eat the skinny kernels and then nobody can he's not happy with how, what other people tell him he's sorceress nobody can interpret well this dream until joseph comes and he tells him actually it's the same dream it's one dream you're gonna have seven years of plenty and you're gonna have seven years of scarcity of, of of hunger of famine in the land and so we see that there's this pattern and in all, both times that Joseph appears to be on his way out, up, uh, then he's cast down once again. And the moment he began to in, indulge in feelings of insecurity as the butcher administrator, he was shown just how fragile that security was after he again felt secure when he was promoted to administrator of the prison. So we see that he comes to the to Potiphar's house and he's given, he becomes the right hand of Potiphar, he's given access to all his house, everything, he knows everything, everything, and then he falls like a, like a coconut. And then in the prison, again, he has access to everybody in the prison, he's like the prison guard being a prisoner and then suddenly for two years he's forgotten and this is the pattern and then we see that that eventually when he comes out and he tells Pharaoh what his dreams mean he makes him instantly it's instantly he becomes from rags to riches and he becomes the viceroy of Egypt he becomes the second in command he's the most important person in Egypt, a second from the Pharaoh, and Pharaoh gives him access to everything, to all the land. Everybody has to go to him. He's the one that feeds people, that gives the food to people. Everything has to go through Joseph. So we see that, that there's a, a component here in which Joseph uh, first is a little haughty, is a little proud of himself. And that's why Hashem brings him down. When he says to the to the wine bearer don't forget me tell pharaoh he's putting his trust in the wine bearer that was his problem he put his trust in him and not in hashem not in saying okay i'm in this place and if hashem wills it for me to get out of here i'm gonna be out of here in one second so that was that's the whole thread of this story one of the many teachings of of the stories of of yosef is that we see that He's going up and he's coming down actually follows the same pattern in which he becomes so sure of himself that he thinks that he controls everything around him that at the end Hashem puts him down again so he can remember who runs the world. So by the end of the parasha, his apparent success, rather than providing him with hope, only made a mockery of his situation, leaving him desperate. And parasha Miketz, this is in Parasha Vayeshev, where he becomes desperate because he's left in the, in the jail. Parasha Mikes shows Joseph once again that he can be promoted. Once again, he's given that chance. So I ask you, how many things in your life have a pattern? Look at your life. Look what happens in your life. When you think you're up here, then suddenly you're here. Look at the patterns in your life because they're really talking to you. They're saying something to you. Most of us, all of us come here to perfect something. We come to do tikkun olam, we come to perfect a certain part of the world where we're put in, in our lives. Every place we go, everything we, we encounter is part of our portion in this world to elevate and to, and to perfect. And the journey of our life when we're put in situations and it's repeatedly done to us that we fall into these people that abuse us or we were humiliated many times or or we we are taken advantage of many times all these patterns in our lives really are there to teach us a lesson and to help us grow and to help us connect to Hashem that's the whole purpose for them 
is to allow us to see who runs the world. So we see here that he was once again promoted, this time to Viceroy of Egypt. And in contrast to his previous promotions, he remained in his prominent post until the end of his life. So he got it. Finally, he got it. And he was left there for the rest of his life. And he was granted not only full control over his own life, but over everybody else's life in Egypt. He was the owner of Egypt. He even made the Egyptians do Brit Mila. He told Pharaoh, if they don't have a Brit Mila, I'm not gonna give them food. And, and everybody complained and he says, you do what, what Joseph says, you do what he says. And he, he had this power. So from this perspective, Joseph's life begins to mirror that of his father, Jacob. And Jacob had also been thrust into very difficult situations uh, in his life. And, um, and, uh, and, and he had to discover how to prosper in spite of them, in demonstrating his ability to flourish in a hostile environment. So we know Jacob's story, he was always tricked. He had to trick the brother to be able to get the blessing from the father. Then he was tricked by Laban when he wanted to marry Rahel and he was given Leah instead and then he had to work another seven years for her, 14 years in total. And his whole life he was tricked by his brother, tricked by his father-in-law. It was a terrible Then He lost his most beloved son, Joseph. He thought he had died. So we see that there is a certain um, parallel situation here and we see that Joseph was starting to manifest the qualities of his father had seen from him from birth qualities that would later enable him to continue the work of Jacob had begun overcoming the most profound challenge to the divine mission which is exile so Yaakov was sent ahead of his family to Egypt that was the beginning of the exile of the Jewish people of Galut we're still in Galut. It's been too many years that we've been in Galut. Uh, while the two temples existed, maybe we had some respite for a few hundred years, but once they were destroyed, we were thrown back into this Galut. And Galut is like a dream. It's like when you're dreaming. What is Galut? What is exile? Exile is when two opposing forces can occur at the same time. So let me explain this a little bit. That's why the world is such a confusing world. That's why sometimes we say, but why don't people get it? Why does this person do this? Why is this happening? You know, you can have a, a, a very righteous person that wakes up in the mor morning and the first thing he does is that he goes to, to the synagogue and he prays, he learns, he gives a daka, he's a righteous person, he takes care of his family, and then he goes on his business, he goes to work, and he is doing fraud, or he's stealing from other people, or he's doing not good things. How can it be? We ask ourselves, how can this be? And you know what? I had an aha moment on Shabbat, last Shabbat, when I was learning this concept of exile, which is amazing. It makes all the sense. Now, every time I look at a situation, I say, this doesn't make sense. I say, it's exile. It's exile. This is exile. Exile is like a, like a dream or like a nightmare where weird things are happening together that don't make sense. That they could never be together in a normal world. And this is exile. The problem is that when we live in exile, we think this is the reality. We think this is how it's supposed to be. And we forget that this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not reality. We're like in a dream-like stage. Like the, the psalm says, we're dreamers, we're dreamers. And so the ability to achieve great heights in the face of exile, this is the secret that Yosef gave us. This is the secret that has taken the Jewish people to, to be able to survive through the millennium and still exist as a Jewish people. Because it really doesn't make any sense that we're still here. Like we're in Hanukkah right now, and, and if you read the story of Hanukkah, you read what happened in those days. Really, it was like 300 years of Jewish people being completely assimilated and turning into Hellenistic people. It doesn't make any sense that with no temples, 
with no Shehina, uh, obvious Shehina with us, the, the divine presence openly and revealed in our lives, that Jewish people are able to still be Jewish that still are lighting their menorahs every Hanukkah, they're eating latkes and, and eating sufganiyot, that they're keeping Shabbat, that they're keeping kashrut, that they're giving tzedakah, that they're keeping the mitzvot. It doesn't make any sense. So here, this parasha of Miketz gives us this tasting of why we're able to do this, why we have still this strength within ourselves and the ability to achieve a great height despite the exile. Exile is the biggest opportunity for us. The, the, the sages say that when Mashiach comes, we're going to miss exile. We're going to say, how didn't I take more advantage of this time of, 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 of our existence? Because in exile is the world of action. This is where things happen. This is where a person has the ability to grow spiritually, connect more to Hashem, to do mitzvot, to, to do the right thing. When the whole world tells you go on the other way, you're doing, like when they say, when you can be anything in the world, be kind. Yes, th this is exile. This is what exile gives us. Once we're in Olam Abba, in the world to come, there's no more of that good and bad, good and evil, light and darkness. It's gone. That you're not going to have that anymore. Everything's going to be good. So it's in precisely in these times of darkness that we have the ability to, to grow, to connect to Hashem, to, do, to, to, to transform the world, to transcend. It's an amazing opportunity. It's very dark. It's very painful. I'm not saying it's not. It's, it's hard times and especially year 2020 has been like a bad nightmare. I can't wait to wake up from it. But on the other hand, if you look at it, it has been such a breeding ground of creativity and opportunity for so many people to do incredible things and families to, to reunite and people to make amends with people they're fighting. Like it puts you in perspective. It puts your life in the right perspective. So this ability to achieve great heights in the face of exile, as an ex exemplified by Joseph, is alluded to in the name of this parasha, Miketz, which means at the end, the word for end actually means extreme. It means it, Miketz not only means at the end, which is really alluding to the end of, of this exile, but it also talks about extreme and thus alludes how, to how evil the lower extreme on the moral con continuum should elicit our inner strengths for good. When you see evil in the world, it should propel you to be better. It, sh it should be like, a, like an energy boost for you to be the best you can be. And so the upper extreme of that continuum, in as much as the two extremes of any process are, are its beginning and its end, the word Miketz alludes not only to the end of the exile, whether Joseph's exile in prison or our press and personal and general exiles, we're all in exile. We have a, a communal exile, the Jewish people are in exile, but also everybody has a personal exile. We all have limitations. We all have things that keep us from being the person we should be. And so, but also to how this nexus itself becomes the beginning of redemption. So we are now in the birth banks of Mashiach. We're in the end of, of exile. We, Hashem created the world to exist, exist 6,000 years. We're in the year 5,781 from creation. So we have some 200 some years to go, but we're already there and you can feel it. The world is moving fast, fast. I, I wake up in the morning and suddenly it's nighttime again. I, I say, at what time? How can it be so fast? And as we will see, Joseph was able to extricate himself from the depths and soar to great heights by learning, learning to surrender his ego. So this is the punchline. This is the punchline. We have to learn to surrender our egocentric nature. We have to learn to nullify ourselves and, and, and become one with Hashem. And as soon as he acknowledged, as soon as he acknowledged, this is when he acknowledged God's presence and providence in his life, 
abandoning the illusion that his achievements were the result of his own powers, true success is to elude him. So he didn't come out of the prison when the wine bearer came out because he thought that he is the one that's going to save him. No, yeah, maybe he's going to be a shlia, but he can never forget who is the one that takes him out. And then he was stuck there for two more years. And when he realized that Hashem is the only power in his life, that he's the one that makes him intelligent, he's the one that makes him shrewd, he's the one that makes him handsome, and he gives him the opportunities to be Joseph, and he acknowledged this, then that was the time in which he was out of that prison in one second. And when he came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to him, please interpret my, my dreams, uh, they, you have, um, they say you're incredible interpreting dreams. He said, no, it's not me. It's God. God through me tells me what you're dreaming. So these then are the lessons of this parasha, of parasha Miketz, that every descent we undergo, every time we go down in life, every time we don't pass the test, every time we're presented with a similar situation again, which means that we didn't learn anything, is only there to give us the opportunity to go back, take strength, and run much far faster. The reason for a descent is the ascent. That's the only reason why a person uh, falls down or is not successful in his life. And I don't mean only successful in being famous and having money and being in Instagram. No, that's not what I mean. I mean successful is in achieving his potential in life. That is true success. So the key to transforming a descent into an ascent is letting go of our ego, is getting rid of our ego and recognizing that everything comes from God and that the challenge of exile is to turn the tables on it, copting the powers of passion and ambition and transforming them into good and holy forces. So our job here, my friends, is to recognize Hashem, is to reveal God in this world through our actions, through our deeds, and to put the name it is. You know, there, now there's this big movement. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Yes, Baruch Hashem. The more you recognize God in your life, the more you're going to have a godly existence. You know, the, the, the sages teach, why do we have a shadow? Why did God put the shadow? Why do we need a shadow? It's not random. Hashem gave us a shadow, so we know that in the way that we go, in the way that we move, Hashem is going to go with us. So if in your life you're not going in the right direction, Hashem is going to take you also in that direction. It's, to re it's a reminder that the shadow moves wherever you go. So if you're going in the good direction, it's a reminder that the shadow, Hashem, is going with you in the right direction. So I leave you here. I wish you a blessed week. And remember, live a little higher. Thank you.